Hey everyone, Evan here. Today we're going to talk about hatching. Before we get into all the concepts and little tips and tricks I have for hatching itself as a concept, I really want to talk about starting. Because if you don't have something to hatch into and out of, really finding proportion and making a commitment to something is going to be a little difficult. So here I'm going in and just starting to block in my major proportions and placement on the page for my subject, which is a pepper. Uh, if you've been a student of mine, you've drawn these at least once or 20 times. So here we have an armature drawing concept, and this is just what it sounds like. If you've ever sculpted, an armature is just an underlying support to then be built on top of. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's sort of a very open block-in concept if you're used to the um, sort of the French academic history of drawing, uh, which is very focused on shape. I love shape as a way in, and it's a really malleable um, graphic concept. And I think it has a lot to do with the graphic silhouette, which is the outline you're seeing here on the left. Um, this, however, is a little too simple, and I've pretty much already achieved it in my uh, start. And so I'm starting to think a lot more about refining the interior boundaries. And this has a lot to do with what people think of as contour, but contour is more of a finishing statement for me. It describes form, light, weight, overlap, and depth, subtle orientation shifts, right? So I don't want to get too refined too soon. So I'm not thinking in terms of finish contours. I'm thinking in terms of placeholder notes for my boundaries. So what I'm starting to do now is work around the far side. And that's in an effort to better understand uh, what's called the notional space. How much space does this subject take up? Uh, top to bottom, right to left, and front to back. The front to back is the important thing to consider here. When you start with graphic shapes as your way in, which is how we see, right? We, we think in line, but we see in shape. So as I'm engaging with shape, I need to keep in mind that I need to represent space. And so this uh, back boundary of the, uh, the end of the uh, platform against the wall, that's going to help me show something behind my subject. And as I start to refine the component parts, which here I've colored in different colors, so you can see how their shapes fit together like puzzle pieces and how I'm going to use that to help me refine my... Um, my proportions and my placements and my gestural notes. Um, here I'm actually going in and cleaning up some of those shapes just to make them a bit more clear for myself. And it's all in service of understanding how this object goes from front to back and then sort of comes back around. So I tend to always start my refinement pass or my check, which is what I'm doing now. I'm checking my shapes. I tend to do it from the bottom up, and I like going from the front to back with things like peppers. I want to go with the largest piece of something that I can see, especially if there's multiple component parts like these chambers. And so you're going to see that I'm starting to carve away or chip away at the internal boundary notes I have with uh, something that I kind of think about as secondary angle lines. These are lines that sit within the context of the big angles I found previously, but they're more nuanced. They push and pull and restrict or open up the form that I have, and they just create a more complex statement. So that's my aim here. Hopefully you can see that on the page and that that makes a little bit of sense. Um, I tend to think of them as secondary angles that without the context of what came before, they wouldn't be as full or as uh, strong. So you can see that now I've addressed the front chamber. I'm moving around to the back and I am going to the left in this instance. And I'm really looking for the shape of this chamber and how the chambers uh, as shapes puzzle piece into each other. How does that back shape lock into the side shape? How does the side shape lock into the front shape? What's overlapping what? Where does that stem come into play, right? How articulate do I need to be right now to get a feeling of depth? 
I don't think the stem was really helping me with that. So I, and I also, frankly, if I'm being honest, I don't like bell pepper stems. I think they look like a living cartoon. So I tend to avoid them for a while. So now I'm starting to, to chip away. I'm, I'm starting to play with the internal boundaries a little bit more. And you can see I'm constantly making adjustments to these angles, constantly comparing uh, what I have on the page with what I'm seeing. So right now, I'm reacting to where I've began. It's at this moment where I'm feeling pretty good. It's, 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 it's a pretty good start. So I'm taking the kneaded eraser and I am uh, refining and cleaning my graphic silhouette. I'm reasserting my big shape statement, but I'm also going in and opening up some of the denser, harder boundaries right after the overlapping forms. And that's just going to let everything breathe. Just open up that drawing and let the thing breathe a little bit. I found that when I was a student, and you know, if I'm rushing or drawing on autopilot, I still do this. Uh, I make things a little too dark and a little too constricted. Things can't breathe, you know? Um, so now I'm going in with a tonal hatch. And it's a hatch mark that builds out a shape. All the hatches are going the same direction. And it creates a tone shape. Usually it follows the form, like that right there on the stem, or sometimes it's a diagonal hatch going from top to bottom across the form to create a, a mark that doesn't stop my form in its tracks. Uh, a vertical hatch or horizontal hatch, if, uh, if they're a little too prominent right now, would flatten everything out. If you want to see a beautiful example of tonal hatching, uh, look at Leonardo da Vinci's ink drawings in his sketchbooks. You'll, you'll notice a lot of his hatchwork uh, goes from left to right, which I think is really f a, a beautiful thing. Um, and it's supported by his really, really gorgeous contours. But all of his value, for the most part, at least in ink, tends to be uh, single directional. On a diagonal, it's really beautiful. Someone else to look at would be Alphonse Le Gros. The Met has a lot of his silver points. I definitely would encourage you to check those out. You can uh, research him on their website, and a bunch of his images and high res will pop up. It's a really great resource. So now I'm going in and reasserting shape, trying to find uh, light and shadow. And I'm just thinking about these planes. As a plane turns away from the light, it'll get darker and darker and eventually fall into shadow. And that grand shadow statement is a grand planar statement, right? This is the part of my subject that is angled away from the light. So those notan concepts can also be structural concepts, depending on how you think of them. So I'm going to slow down my demo here and, you know, take off the uh, hyperspeed and you're just going to see me make a lot of hatches in, in real time now. And I'm starting to think about very large planes, um, very broad planes. And that's kind of where, where I always start with. What's, what's a big broad plane note? Here on the left, you can see sort of a secondary smaller plane breakdown. And that's kind of where I'm hatching now as I work around the far side, the smaller plane notes you're going to see a, a breakdown in a second that's a little nutty. Um, and it's not necessarily how I was looking at this pepper, but it is how I was hatching around this pepper as I move forward. So this is like that tertiary level uh, planar breakdown where I'm hatching smaller and smaller and smaller, finding more and more nuances in these planes. And that's what I'm doing right now at that core and as I'm hatching out towards that light. It's just smaller and smaller plane shapes, and my hatches get a little denser, a little tighter. Here on the left, you can see a diagram of that. As the planes change, my hatches on them change as well. Hatching with the plane uh, prioritizes any subtle orientation shift, right? Anytime the plane or the form bends, my hatch has to follow that bend. And this is what leads to, to this idea of carving right? And th the first principle of a carving hatch mark is you follow the plane. You carve with the planes. And that's what this diagram is all about. 
And there are many ways to follow a plane. If you look on side A, I'm following it horizontally. If you look on side B, I'm following it vertically. Now, the vertical hatch mark, I think, is a little flatter than side A, the horizontal hatch mark, because the horizontal has everything to do with the forms coming out at us. So we're seeing a lot of tapering. We're seeing a, a lot of uh, projection off the from left out to the right. It just seems to get fuller because I'm hatching with that plane. So here you can see a very simple plane following hatch schema where I'm creating this box idea depending on the angle and placement of my hatches. I like to have a lot of fun with this and work around the form, hatching with the planes to create complex curvatures. And that's what you're seeing here on the left is how I'm stacking these uh, plane following marks. And they actually cross hatch themselves, which is a really wonderful um, concept. So I don't have to necessarily worry about how I'm hatching. I just have to follow those planes and everything will naturally stitch. And how do I organize that? Well, if you look on the left, you'll see that I, or I organize my hatches with the planes going from the shadow up to the light. And I find that super helpful because it prioritizes volume. So even though I'm thinking in terms of single plane as I work, I'm still finding volumes as I work around the form. So hopefully that diagram on the left makes a little bit of sense and you can see how I'm doing that on the right. So here I'm going back in and finding a big broad plane in the shadow trying to shape that from a graphic uh, shadow moment into a form. And on the, on the left, we can talk a little bit about cross-hatching and what my recommendations are. When you're in kindergarten, you're taught cross-hatching for the first time, and it just means that, you know, you make one mark and then you do the opposite on top and then they crisscross and there's your cross-hatching. Unfortunately, that's not you know, really too applicable for what we're doing now. We want to create a richer aesthetic and a more descriptive form following or plain following note. And so I, I always recommend doing a diamond hatch instead of a box hatch. A box hatch is number A, and your crisscrossing hatches create 90 degree angles, which makes a box in between them. Whereas with B, where you're hatching on a 45 or an oblique angle, you're creating these elongated diamond shapes. And the eye can't rest in those long diamond shapes. And so you tend to create really rich tones that create this uh, lively sensibility on the surface of your subject. Uh, if you want to see a beautiful example of diamond hatchings, look at Albrecht Dürer and Hendrik Goldsius, um, two astounding engravers and printmakers from the past. So... You might notice I'm starting to hatch a little bit more broadly, a little bit more open. This is because I am following the, the big planes now, or the form, sorry. And I'm hatching with the form, and so what that means is I'm crossing multiple planes at once, creating sort of a longer, broader hatch mark that maybe speaks to three to five planes. And you can still cross-hatch, as you see on side B there. I'm still creating those diamonds, even though I'm only using curved hatches. And you can stack these. You can stack them to create really fun and interesting um, hatch patterns all over your form. So you can get a moment of complexity and a moment of um, openness, uh, depending on how you're hatching. And on the left, on the bottom, you can see a very loose description of hatching over a form. And depending on my perspective, you know, am I looking straight at it or am I looking at the left or the right? The hatch mark will change as it follows that form. And it's kind of like a yarn ball, which is my favorite descriptor of this concept. So with the yarn ball idea, it's just I hatch as if I were to wrap a string and trace the surface around my form, right? And there are many ways you can follow a form. You just want to make sure that you're not cutting into the form, the little yarn ball with the X through it on the bottom there is cutting through that form, right? And this has everything to do with making a cylinder out of a box, okay? You can think about form following strokes like that. 
You can hatch with only straight lines and imply curvatures, no problem. In fact, a great deal of structure can be found that way. However, a graceful curvature, especially with a hatch mark, can lend a different sensibility to the form. And to create a curved hatch, you know, you have to envision where two straight planes might meet and then just wrap around them. So hopefully the diagrams on the left will help you kind of figure out what I mean. Um, I'm just hatching around the planes and I can stitch them together to create a full rounded form following hatch, or I can just hatch broadly around the form, almost like I'm wrapping my pencil or tracing the topology of the form with my pencil. And that's the, those are the two major ways that I work around a form. And here you can see I'm doing a lot of uh, form following hatches as I carve around that edge. And it, it looks a lot more full when I do that. It's a lot of fun. So here, uh, yep, just big, broad, sweeping hatch marks. Even on a shallow, low-relief plane like that, I'm still doing a big, broad hatch. So what do you do if you want to stack them, right? So on the left, I have plane-following hatch marks in orange, and then blue, which are form-following hatch marks on top. And... I pulled inspiration from Tiepolo. Uh, if you don't know his drawings, definitely check them out. They're gorgeous. And he hatches with the form across the Terminator line on his work. Here, you can see I'm kind of building up maybe uh, a half tone, you know, from the plane following hatch marks, right? Something that's um, giving a little bit of value, maybe either the shadow edge or just outside of the shadow edge. And it doesn't really matter how you hatch around the form as long as you describe that form. But the goal is, for me anyway, is to not carry a value too far into a zone where you don't want it. You don't want to ruin your light effect in your description of form. Okay, so my recommendation for that is to make use of all that hard work you did on the front end of finding that terminator edge that really strong graphic shadow edge where the where the planes are facing away from your light source, right? Creating that terminator line, that terminus. So what I do is I take those angles that create that edge and I hatch parallel out of them up towards the light. And I lighten my pressure on my pencil as I go. And what that does is it creates the illusion of shadow wrapping around the form up towards the light. And it's a great way to be exploratory with your subject and maybe build up a light effect over time, right? It's all about carving. But in this case, we're describing the tactile form and we're describing light at the same time because I'm not worried about bringing a tone that's too dark into the light. I'm keeping my pressure light and breathable and adjustable. And that's the important part. I can always modify what I'm doing. So hopefully this is making a little bit of sense uh, and that my images are, are very clear um, on, on the left here. I feel like this was a big revelation for me. Michael Grimaldi was the one who... Uh, I think he demoed this four or five times for me until it finally clicked in the uh, life room at, at the New York Academy when we were drawing our model. And when I realized, oh, this is why my shadow edge is so important. Oh, this is what creates the shadow edge. Oh, this is how I can work around a form without carving into the form in a way that looks like a recessed pit. You know, I don't want to put a hole in something. I just want to create the idea of its its fullness and its um, spatial clarity, right? So here on the left, you can see that uh, what I also do, and if you look at my website or my Instagram, you'll, you'll find a lot of my drawings where um, I'm hatching with white. And a lot of times that's me actually lifting out with an eraser. I use uh, General Pencil's Factus BM-2 Mechanical Eraser. Um, it sounds silly, but that thing changed my life because it's the same width as my pencil. And so I don't have to change my thinking when I lift out. 
I'm not using a paintbrush language as I do with the kneaded eraser, right? So here on the left, you can see that before I was hatching out of the shadow, and now I'm hatching out of the light. So as I hatch out of the shadow, I reach up towards the light or the peak of the form. As I hatch with the light, I hatch down towards the shadow. And my hatch work, they're going to meet in the middle, and they're going to naturally crisscross in, in beautiful ways that are a lot of fun. In this demonstration, I don't have the chance to actually hatch out and create my lights. I do have demonstration examples coming up down the road uh, in this demo that will show you what I'm talking about right now. But if you look at my work, um, hatching and carving specifically, really shaping form with hatch marks or carving marks, um, it's how I think and it's how I sort of put structure into my work. Okay. Uh, I think now's a good time to discuss the idea of a middle game because we're well past the start of this drawing, right? So I'm building on top of what came before. I'm using what I had. Uh, or as I say in class, I'm using what I've earned, right? I've earned a good solid foundation. I'm using the armature and I'm building on top of that. I'm responding to my start and I'm in the middle game. And this is a beautiful moment for reassessment and checks. And so I love hatching because it lets me shape and modify what I've started with because what you begin with is never really true. It's it's always your first um, naive pass. As as your eye observes something for a longer longer time, you become sharper. You see more. You understand the relationships better. Um, this this profound clarity starts to arrive the longer that you work. And I think your process needs to support that, or at least at you know leave leave room for it. And so that's what I'm attempting to do here is show you sort of the beginning of a middle game strategy. And mine tends to be all about hatching. Even if I'm painting, I'm doing this with broken color. Typically, you know, uh, the impressionists are the best at that concept. Uh, Monet might be my favorite, um, just in the way that he's hatching and creating these spots of broken color and creating a full effect. And you could definitely tell he was sculpting his form with paint and light over time. Odd Nerdrum and Stephen Assail, I think, both do this broken effect really well also in very different ways. So if you're looking for painters, I think that they're fantastic. Uh, someone else who is definitely worth noting for um, hatch marks in painting uh, would be Anne Gale. If you don't know her work, please look it up. Um, her paintings specifically floor me every time. So here I am sort of building out this middle game, and it's all a response to the start. And it's not about refinement. It's about reappraisal. Okay, and hatching is allowing me to reappraise my initial marks, my initial proportion, gesture relationships, and uh, broad light and dark statements. And you can see I'm finding edge notes, I'm um, shaping these chambers a little bit here and there, and just kind of working around this uh, form, which I got to say was a lot of fun. I love drawing peppers. I know my students are a little sick of them. Um, that hasn't happened to, to me yet. Two things I never get sick of, skulls and peppers. So here I'm playing around. You're actually going to see that I, I really push this way too dark. And I, I, I noticed that as I was doing it and I kept doing it, which is a habit that I have. Um, I should work on that. But here you're going to see I take an eraser and start to sort of dab that out, open that up. And then I use my finger to knock it back. I don't think there's anything wrong with stumping or smudging or just moving the dirt around on the page. You know, it's it's not drawn in blood, right? It's it's made to be modified and, and moved and pushed and pulled and and just played with, you know. And that's, that's really how I think about my drawings more and more. They're just clay sculptures on a flat surface, right? 
And so I'm shaping this clay. So as I do that on the right, um, let's talk about some drawings on the left here. This is a drawing of one of the models from the New York Academy when I was a TA, uh, Alan. And I, I put this in because it's very sketchy, very broad. And you can see how I was sculpting and refining forms with hatches almost exclusively. I was doing a lot of smudging and then lifting out with an eraser with shape. But then I went back in with hatching and edge notes just to refine what I have. My goal really was to draw him as if he was made of stone. And I put this drawing in right after that because this was a two hour um, sketch in my studio with my uh, good friends, David Stallings, Jeff Geib, and Tina Yanni. And we were kind of playing around with uh, different model poses. And Quinn, our model, who's also an amazing artist, took this gorgeous pose. And I just had a blast hatching around all of the uh, forms and finding the light and shadow statements. And you can see I'm doing a lot of plane following hatch marks, but also a lot of form following hatches and how I'm letting my hatches create shapes. And that's really how I, how I built this drawing up, but also how I'm creating texture. And this is a Prismacolor Very Thin color pencil, and it, they're just beautiful to work with. This is a different type of color pencil. Uh, the, the Very Thin Prismacolor pencil, the terracotta one of Quinn, that was a, a wooden pencil that I sharpened. This blue pencil is made by Pentel. It's a mechanical color pencil lead. And it's one of my favorite colors to draw with. If you know my work, you know I work a lot with red and blue pencils. And those are both mechanical pencils, uh, 0.5 millimeters, which is my favorite size. It breaks a lot, but I love the control of the line that I can get at the edges. And here you're seeing a lot of that, me just shoving a little sharp edge note in there every once in a while. And I'm using hatching to find and describe anatomical forms and structures, not so much the light effect. So I put this in because I wanted to show a more tactile based carving approach that's a little scratchy and a little rough, but you can see how I'm using shape, how I'm using measurement lines, how I'm using contour notes, how I'm redefining contour notes as the pose changed. Uh, this drawing was done in between teaching uh, when I was a TA at the New York Academy, I believe for Dan Thompson. Dan talks a lot about hatchwork, and one of the things that he talks about that I think is, is really insightful is how he relates it to, to sculpture, which is the rake tool. If any of you have worked in a subtractive method with sculpture, I'm sure that you've used a rake tool before, and uh, it creates beautiful hatches on, on your work. Um, this drawing here of Jamal, I did in graphite and it was built up over a long period of time of adding and subtracting and adding and subtracting, stumping to knock it down and then adding hatch work and shape and pulling out with lights just to, to reinvigorate this, this drawing. I'm actually a big fan of using the paper stump or the brush or a chamois or just my dirty hands and uh, just kind of messing with the graphite on the page or the medium on the page. With charcoal, I use a brush all the time to blend and blur and push and pull. And I always go back in. The stump or the chamois or whatever tool you use. A cat, as my one student, Harry, just said over the weekend. Um, it's, it's about modifying, not finishing, right? And... So you always go back in, you always go back in and darken, you always go back in and lighten. And I'd like to, to show you that in one of my drawings. So this is a, a drawing of my friend and fellow artist, uh, Leah Limpert Waltz hands. Her and I were trading time and I chose this one to show because I really was pushing around the dirt on the paper and I got to lift out with the eraser and you can see those form following and plane following hatch marks with the eraser adding uh, a luminosity to the drawing which is very needed here but also you know you see the darkest shapes are shadows the darkest tonalities are edge notes and lines 
and the light is all about creating volume. So thanks, everybody. I hope you all learned something, and I hope you all found this entertaining, uh, and I hope it didn't ramble too much. <laughs>